It is such a pleasure to be here with you today virtually. And we're going to be talking about climate change and about what's happening in our world today because it's all related. So let me share my screen to get started with you. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be collecting questions from you as we go along. And then at the end, Joanne will be choosing from your questions and we'll be having a discussion. So here's how you can pose a question at any time during my presentation. You have to go to pollev.com slash Catherine, which is my name. The link is going to be in the chat just now, so you can click on it if you want to, too. Or you can go to pollev.com and enter Catherine. And when you do that, you're going to see this come up. Questions. Write your own or upvote another's. Now, it might ask you for your name. Don't worry. You can just push skip for that. No need to put in a name. But when you get to the questions, you're going to be able to see the questions other people have asked there. And you're going to be able to put in your own question as well. And you can do this at any time throughout the presentation. And we'll take those questions at the end. So if you're doing it on your phone, this is what it's going to look like. And if you push the top button here, you'll be able to see the questions ranked in order. And these all will obviously move along, move around as we go along. So at any time, please feel free to put your questions in pollev.com slash Catherine. And the link again will be in the chat. If you forget what it was, you can just go to the chat, click on it, and you'll see it pop right up in your browser. So I want to start by talking about climate change a very, very, very long time ago. 11 months ago, to be precise, which at this point in our lives sort of feels like it was 11 years ago, doesn't it? What was the situation pre-COVID? If we cast our mind back to last year, headlines last December were global fossil fuel emissions are increasing because of China. Greenland and Antarctica are melting six times faster than they did in the 1990s. Climate change has worsened global economic inequality. The gap between the richest and poorest countries in the world has increased by 25% since the 1960s because of the impacts of a changing climate that have already occurred. We saw headlines about how climate change is profoundly unjust. It disproportionately affects women and children, especially in poor countries. It affects indigenous peoples and it affects communities of color, especially right here in the United States. Yet at the same time, the United States is becoming more and more politically polarized. These are figures from the Pew uh, Foundation, and they've looked at what the political landscape of the US looked like. So 26 years ago, the average Democrat and Republican were pretty close together. But as they step through time, what's been happening? People have been moving farther and farther apart. And if they ask people only who voted in the last presidential election, not this most recent one, but the one before that, this is what the political landscape looked like. The average Democrat and the average Republican was closer to the tails of their own party than they were to each other. And in this politically polarized issue, climate change falls right in the hole in the middle. As of last year, we had, uh, now President-elect Biden saying things like, from coastal towns to rural farms to urban centers, climate change poses an existential threat. And then we had President Trump saying things like, the concept of global warming was created by the Chinese to make US manufacturing non-competitive. I'm in LA and it's freezing. Global warming is a hoax. When the Pew Foundation surveyed people uh, on different issues, they found that the issues on which Democrats and Republicans were most far apart back in February, pre-COVID, now I know technically there was already some COVID here, but pre-awareness, pre-lockdown, pre-pandemic, climate change and environmental protections were at the very top of the list. The width of the gray bar shows how far apart the average Republican and the average Democrat is on an issue, and the wider the gray bar, the more politically polarized the issue. So we had climate change and environmental protection at the very top of the list of most politically polarized issues. And then this happened. Now, climate change has not gone away. The tsunami is still there. But when you have a tsunami that's much closer right in your face, which is COVID today, that has the effect of overwhelming our attention, overwhelming our concern, overwhelming our responses. 
And when the tsunami first crashed down on us, for a brief time, the world was united. No matter where you lived, no matter what language you spoke, no matter uh, what you did, everybody was watching videos on how to wash your hands and sharing them with everybody that you loved. We were seeing videos of people going out on their balconies and apartment buildings everywhere from New York to Italy, singing together or doing exercises together. We were gathering people from around the country to sing together. This is a sing-along they had in Canada where everybody voted on the most popular song. They picked one by Blue Rodeo and then they got 50,000 people to sing along and they made a video of it. And of course, everyone was baking bread. So for a brief time, which seems almost incredible, everyone in the world was thinking about and doing the same things, showing us that what makes us human is much we have much more in common that way than what normally we think of as dividing us. We also saw headlines comparing the air quality in cities like Delhi with what it looked like during the lockdown, comparing the clarity of water in Venice with what it looked like before the lockdown. We saw, however briefly, a glimpse of a better world. We even learned that air pollution was going down. And because that air pollution was going down, here's a picture of what it looked like in January versus February in China, for example. And we saw similar changes here in North America from March to April. It actually saved lives because people die from air pollution regularly, 200,000 in the US every year. So we saw some good news. We saw some rays of hope. And we learned that in April, the world's global carbon emissions dropped by 17%. Most of it was surface transportation, but a lot of it was industry, power generation, even aviation. For a few moments, a little sprout of green hope seemed to grow from the dry ground. And then the other headlines began. Air pollution is right back up to pre-lockdown levels. Carbon emissions are sharply rebounding as countries lift the coronavirus restrictions. People who are already marginalized, who are already disproportionately affected by the impacts of air pollution and changing climate, of the 200,000 people that die from air pollution every year in the US, the majority of them come from poor, disadvantaged communities and communities of color, well, it turns out that air pollution makes you much more vulnerable to what? To COVID. If your lungs have already been exposed to air pollution over years and even decades, you're much more likely to get COVID if you're exposed to coronavirus and you're much more likely to get very sick and even die from it than somebody who isn't exposed to so much air pollution. So for example, and this is just one example for Chicago, we saw this across multiple countries, about 30% of the population of Chicago is African American, but about 70% of the deaths were. And air pollution, they believe, is the hidden link. It wasn't just here, it wasn't just in rich countries. Headlines like COVID pushes millions more children deeper into poverty. COVID is fueling more conflict, more poverty, more starvation. And then the myths. Just like the climate change myths that people drag up, oh, it's not real, it's not happening, those scientists are just making it up. In the same way, we started to see myths about COVID. Oh, if you just do this one thing, it'll fix it. Or it's not as bad as the flu. Or masks actually make it worse. And just like false information on climate change spreads much faster on social media, as Mark Twain famously said, at least it's attributed to him, a lie can circle the world while the truth is still getting its boots on. Twitter has shown that that actually happens and it started to happen with COVID too. Not only that, but some of the very same organizations that uh, create and disseminate climate information were creating, or climate disinformation, were creating and disseminating disinformation about COVID as well. And so when we saw this cartoon, we climate scientists laughed a hollow and bitter laugh as long as we just provide the facts to the American people, surely they will make the right decisions. And we climate scientists are like, we've been doing that since the 1960s, when scientists first warned Lyndon B. Johnson of the risks of a changing climate. Unfortunately, we saw the same patterns. And, and this is really crazy, look at this. This is the same Pew Foundation study 
looking at political polarization right here now it's not ranked in terms of the width of the gray bar so let me show you by august 2020 the number three most politically polarized issue in the whole us was the coronavirus outbreak it was the third most politicized issue number two was race and ethnic inequality and what was number one climate change still so at this point, your face may look more like this. What does it take to make people care? And that begs the most common question that I get, which is, does that mean it's hopeless? If even such extreme draconian measures to alter human behavior during the last few months aren't enough to impact climate change, do we have any hope of fixing it long term? It isn't hopeless. And here's why. Now, it's true that the pandemic didn't have a long-term impact on our carbon emissions. That's because the reductions were not achieved through sustainable changes. Taking kids out of school, making everybody stay home, shutting down small businesses, those are not sustainable changes. We need sustainable changes to fix climate change, like what? Using our energy more efficiently, altering our behavior so we don't need as much, and getting our energy from sources that produce less or no pollution and heat trapping gases. Did you know that according to a report released just a year ago last September, the United States could cut its heat trapping gas emissions 50%. They could cut them in half just by efficiency alone, which obviously saves money too, 50%. Did you know that 2014, six years ago, was the first year that new clean energy installations replaced, or sorry, overwhelmed fossil fuel installations? By, by last year, 70% of new electricity being installed around the world was clean energy, and only 30% was fossil fuels. This is happening in unexpected places, in unexpected ways, on the roofs of churches, uh, in the fields of convents, on the mountains and, and rice fields in poor and developing countries where people don't have access to fossil fuels. The world really is changing and the solutions are myriad. If you're not familiar with Project Drawdown, I would encourage you to please check it out. Sarah, if you could drop that in the chat, drawdown.org is the website. They have over a hundred solutions to climate change that involve all kinds of things from farming and diet and coastal wetland protection and clean energy and distributed storage and conservation agriculture and of course efficiency also. And here's the really cool thing. Our carbon emissions dropped almost 20% temporarily, right? Well, if we want to meet the Paris goals by 2030, we have to cut our carbon emissions about 45%, 45 to 50% by 2030. If the changes we saw temporarily during lockdown had been sustainable and permanent, we would have been halfway to our 2030 Paris goal in just a matter of weeks. Let me say that again. If the carbon emission changes that we temporarily saw during lockdown have been made through sustainable methods, we'd be halfway to our 2030 Paris goal in just a matter of weeks. And the good news is that some of the changes we made are persisting, creating more pedestrian areas, limiting the use of cars in urban centers, telling companies that they have to disclose their climate impacts if they want to get COVID relief in Canada. In France, they told Air France they had to cut their carbon emissions 50% if they want to get a government bailout. We're starting to connect the dots and realize that climate action is action for the health of the planet and for the human race. Both climate change and COVID threaten the health and the safety of our families, our friends, our loved ones, our communities, and our countries. Both of them affect the economy, they affect resource availability, they affect national security, and more. Both COVID and climate change disproportionately affect the sick, the very young and old, the poorest and most vulnerable, both here and abroad. Both of these are, to use a term coined by the US military, a threat 
multiplier. They take the fault lines that already fragment our society and they make them much more visible. But at the same time, they show us that if we can fix them, we can fix a lot of other things too. And here's where our faith comes in. For both of these global challenges, our faith offers a clear roadmap to what our attitudes and our response can and should be. We often talk coming up in April, we often talk about God's greatest gift. And we talk about this at Christmas too. We talk about how God's greatest gift was his son who was born and we celebrate that birth at Christmas and died and we celebrate that death and resurrection at Easter. But we don't often think about what God's second greatest gift to us might be. And I would suggest to you that it might be, you know, if you want to argue and haggle over whether it's two or three, that's okay. But I would suggest that it might be this planet that gives us our physical life. Because we can't just float around in outer space without the resources this planet gives us. Every breath we take, the breath you just took right now, the water that we drink, the food that we eat, the places where we live, everything we have comes from this planet. And not only everything we have, but also the beauty that feeds our souls. So we know from the Bible that God said, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. But did you know there was a reason for that? So that. So that they can, and this is the Hebrew word, rada. They can rada every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. Now, rada was translated in the King James translation as have dominion over. And so for a long time, and even still today, sadly, people use that as justification for extracting everything they can out of the earth and then just saying, oh, God will push the eject button when we're done. But what Rada really means is dominion, but not domination and authority and rule in a way that reflects God's priorities. So let's look at some other places where the same word was used in Hebrew or a similar word was used in Aramaic. In Psalm 72, it talks about how he, speaking of, of God, will Rada from sea to sea. And what will that rule look like? It will look like delivering the needy when they cry for help, the afflicted and those who have no helper, having compassion on the poor and the needy and saving the lives of the needy. That's what Rada looks like. And then in Jesus, in, in Matthew, Jesus actually says, and I think he says again in Mark too, he says, you've observed how godless ru rulers, Rada, how quickly a little power goes to their head. It is not gonna be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must be a servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. This is what the son of man has done. He came to serve, not to be served. And we know just instinctively as humans, if somebody gives you a thriving piece of property and asks you to care for it on their behalf, and if you extract every penny of value from it and you leave it a crumbling and broken ruin, that is not what they intended you to do with that gift that they gave you. And we know today that this incredible planet that we live on is being affected by our choices, cutting the tops off mountains to get coal out of them, taking oil out of the ocean floor, which leads to terrible accidents like the oil spills, cutting down trees, polluting the air, all of this has led to the concept of creation care. And today we have epidemics to add to that too. With terrible irony, WWF Italia from Italy released this report in March, just as their country was being devastated by the pandemic. And they directly showed how, how we treat this planet, our home, deforestation, habitat reduction, trafficking in rare species, Animal markets increases the risk of zoonosis, of, of diseases jumping from animal to human populations and increases the risk of pandemics like the one we're in today. It isn't only about creation care though, as if creation is somehow separate or different from us. Often we think that way and it's a very Western way to think, but the reality is, is that we're living things too. And we know that we are being affected by what we do to our planet. Did you know that one in six premature deaths worldwide are caused by pollution of our air, water, or soil? Pollution is the largest environmental cause of disease and premature death in the world today. 
It's responsible for three times more deaths than from AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. And as climate changes, we know that it affects people. It doesn't just affect the planet. We know that heavy rainfall and flooding is getting worse, and this is affecting farmers and agricultural communities in the Midwest, for example. We know that wildfires are burning greater and greater area in California and in Australia and in Alaska and in British Columbia. We know that we've always had wildfires. We know that the number of wildfires hasn't changed much, but we know that they're burning greater area as hotter and drier conditions dry out the vegetation. We know that sea levels rising and we know that hurricanes are getting stronger. We've seen a lot of hurricanes this year and a big part of the reason why is because when a tropical storm forms, the ocean is so much warmer that it gives it the energy it needs to ratchet up into a hurricane and not just a hurricane, but a category two or three or four or five. Not only that, but they're getting bigger and they're getting stronger and they're dumping a lot more rain on us. When we look at the people who already live in poverty today, and the darker the color here, the more people live in poverty, and we compare this to a map of who's going to be most affected by the impacts of a changing climate, who's most vulnerable, you can see there's a direct correlation between the haves, the have-nots, and the impacts of climate change on us. We know that we get floods in North America and in Southeast Asia, but the impacts are incredibly worse in places where people don't have flood insurance, they don't have the National Guard, they don't have a bank account that they can rely on, we know that we get droughts in Texas and in Syria. But even though the same type of drought hit both countries in the, the 2000s, and in Texas it cost $12 billion worth of damage and caused a lot of economic hardship, in Syria that drought added to an already crisis situation, tipping it over the edge into a refugee and humanitarian crisis. We know that we've been working to develop, help poor countries develop to alleviate global health issues and poverty, but climate change threatens to undo the last 50 years of work on that. So why do we as Christians, why do we as people who believe the Bible care about climate change? It isn't because we're left. It isn't because we're, you know, tree huggers or because we vote a certain way. It's because of who God has made us. God has made us humans all of us responsible for the welfare of every living thing on this planet. And it takes all the risks that we already face, like hurricanes and floods and droughts, like poverty and inequality, hunger, racism and injustice, and it makes them worse. It affects real people here and now today, especially the poorest and most vulnerable. And with climate change and COVID, it's like a one, two punch. So the last question is this, and don't forget as you go along, if you're listening to this live, if you're listening to the recording, I'm sorry, you're out of luck. But if you're listening to this live, don't forget as we go along, you can be adding your questions to pollev.com and you can be upvoting the questions that you most want us to answer. So it will look like this if you're looking at it on your phone. But the last question I'm gonna answer before we go to your questions is this, what are we supposed to do about this? Because this is a global issue. It's an overwhelming issue. And I'm just one person. What am I supposed to do? Well, for us as Christians, as people who take the Bible seriously, our actions begin with our attitudes. And in the book of Timothy, the Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy, giving him advice. And he says this. And this verse, I think, is even more relevant and resonant today than it was back then. It says, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. So if we experience fear, we have a litmus test telling us that that fear is not from God. What has God given us? God has given us a spirit of power. Now that might sound a bit charismatic. You might expect, you know, some healing or speaking in tongues at this point. But let me just express this in modern day English. To have power, to be empowered means that you are able to act. What happens when we're afraid? Typically we freeze, we're paralyzed. So rather than being paralyzed by fear, God has given us the ability to act, to be empowered, to take action. 
God has given us the spirit of love to have compassion on and to care for other people, not just ourselves. And as a scientist, I have to love this last one. God has given us a sound mind to make good decisions based on the facts and data and information that his creation and his science is telling us. So what does the response look like that is not fearful, but that is empowered to act, that has love and compassion and is based on a sound mind? One way that we can respond is by acting lovingly. So acting lovingly, so many organizations like Tear Fund and Arasha and World Vision, they know about climate change, they care about climate change. And when disaster strikes, they're on the front lines helping people who are affected. We're also able to act in community. And this is something really cool. For example, this is just one example. There's an organization called We Renew that has created a website where people can act in community and they've got one for the Episcopal Church of America. So people can sign up with your household and you can see together how you can take action together. You can learn from other people who have already taken action and you can see the power of acting together in community as a body, which is what we as Christians are built to do. We are called the body, right? We can also act wisely and be good stewards of our resources. Uh, Colby May is a graduate of our university, Texas Tech, and then he went to seminary. And then he decided that he was gonna start a consulting business to help churches and seminaries and schools do energy audits to reduce their energy bills, reduce their carbon footprint, and be good stewards of their resources. There's so much waste simply in the way we operate our buildings, for example, that we could be using in better and greater ways. But the number one thing that anyone can do about climate change is this, talk about it. Now, you're not getting my TED talk here. You have to go watch it. But I will explain to you why talking is so important. Because when you ask people across the country, do you think global warming is happening? Most people say yes. Across the whole country, just about every single county, the majority of people would say, yes, global warming is happening. But then if you ask them, do you ever, or sorry, do you ask them, do you think it will harm you personally? Do you think it will affect you? Most people say, no, I don't think it'll affect me. And then you say, do you ever talk about it or hear somebody else talking about it? People say, no, I don't. And here's the connection. If you never talk about it, why would you think it matters? And if you don't think it matters, why would you ever do anything to fix it? So talking about it is so important, but how we talk about it also matters because when climate changes, we get worried and who wouldn't be worried looking at the headlines. So what we do often is we share more scary information with people because we think if they're not scared, they should be. So I'm going to tell them more scary information, which is what? Fear. What happens? Unfortunately, our brains are wired such that if we're overwhelmed with fear, we just reject it even more and inaction results. As neuroscientist Tally Sherratt says, she says fear and anxiety cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than taking action. And so rather than fixing climate change, the problem just gets worse. So we have to break this vicious cycle by talking about it the right way. So when climate changes and we get worried, here's where we break the cycle. We have conversations that researcher Matthew Goldberg shows creates a true positive feedback loop by sharing why climate change matters to us here now and today, and what are some positive solutions that we can do to fix it. People feel empowered. They understand how it matters to them not just the future, not just polar bears, but them. They understand what they can do about it and action results. As neuroscientist Tally Sherratt says again, the human brain is built to associate forward action with a reward. So we have to reframe the way we talk about this so the information we provide induces hope, not dread. So how do we have genuine effective conversations about climate change? We talk about it by bonding over shared values, like our faith, by explaining what people need to know about how it affects us here and now today, and by finding ways that we can work together to act. And at St. John's, there is the creation care team that is doing exactly that. 
When it all comes down to it, here's what matters. As Paul says in Galatians, the only thing that counts is when our faith expresses itself through love. And so when I think of climate change, I think of it as loving our global neighbor. Thank you. Catherine, thank you. That was very moving and we're, we're, um, we're grateful to you uh, for your words and your wisdom and your insights. Uh, I'm looking at your, uh, your poll. We have a few questions that were submitted beforehand and uh, you've really addressed the first of them, which is what uh, the best thing individuals might be able to do. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we so appreciate your, your bringing us to that point of conversation. Uh, on your screen, you can probably also see John Moore, a member of our committee. Uh, he is also bringing that conversation uh, to a larger audience through a group called Elder Climate Action. Uh, mm -hmm. And a number of the members of our committee are working in our communities for this. So um, I think there is an appetite in our community to think about uh, where the presidential election uh, may have brought us and uh, whether that gives you more hope um, that the American government will act. So that's one of our top questions that's come up. Absolutely. And before I do that, let me just put in the chat um, the link to my TED Talk. So it is there too, right here. Um, and that has more about how do we actually have these conversations. So where do you find hope is probably the biggest question I get. And I have to say, first of all, I don't find hope in the science because the science just shows that things are changing faster to a greater extent than we thought. And although we often pin our hope on politics, and there's some justification to it because a president who understands that, that the issue is real and something needs to be done is different than a president who is actively trying to move things backward as the Trump administration has been doing the last four years. Ultimately, we know that our hope is not in politics either. A single politician is not going to save us either because they still have to deal with Congress and the Senate and legislation and uh, lobbyists and powerful corporations. I find my hope in looking at what people are doing because there are people all over. Almost 50% of the US cities, states, corporations, tribal nations, churches, universities, almost 50% of the US was still in on its Paris goals throughout the Trump administration, including the city of Houston, which of course is home to many of the largest multinational oil and gas corporations in the world. I find my hope in looking what individual people are doing and how they're making a difference. And a lot of those changes and a lot of those actions are coming in churches or through faith-based groups. But ultimately as Christians, when we look to hope, we look to what we believe. And in Romans, the Bible says something very interesting and very counterintuitive about hope. It begins not with good circumstances or not with getting what we thought we wanted to happen. It begins with suffering. And it says suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope that will not disappoint because ultimately our hope is placed in God. And we know, and this relates directly to us, that we are simply called to walk in the good works that he prepared for us in advance. So the entire world is not on your shoulders or my shoulders or any one person's shoulders. The world is on God's shoulders and he's given each of us unique tasks to do that we can do because of the gifts that he has given us. So all we have to do is just step by step, walk in the good works that he has prepared for us, whether we are um, a kid at school, whether we are the president of the United States, whether we are, are involved in the elders climate action or the creation care uh, team at our school, or if we're doing, if we're getting involved through our business or our place of work or our community, each of us is just called step by step to take the next action, the next good work that has been prepared for us in advance. So this is uh, John and um, I was looking at the, uh, the poll and one of the questions um, is that, that seems to be getting the top one is what single policy if implemented globally would have the best chance of uh, in, instigating, mitigating climate change? And I know that's slightly contrary your message, but it is mm -hmm. still part of the you individual, but you also have the political and the bigger picture. So if, yes, uh, 
No, I like that question. That's a great question. And I'm a scientist, so I'm not a policy expert. But what I do do is I look to experts in policy and in economics. And what nearly every economist in the entire world says, including the two who were awarded the Nobel Memorial Prize two years ago, they say that the single most effective thing that we can do immediately, and this could be done as soon as you know a country would pass it, would be to put a price on carbon. Because we've been treating carbon as if it had no cost. But we understand now that climate change, which is primarily caused by carbon emissions, has a tremendous cost that could be a quadrillion dollars by the end of the century. Yeah, they had to actually pull out a new number for us, for us to understand how big the impacts are. So putting a price on carbon is something that would immediately shift the market to consider the real price on carbon. And it would change everybody's individual decisions to where if somebody still wanted to drive a gas guzzler, they could, but they'd pay the price for it. Whereas if somebody wanted to save money, then they could buy a more efficient car. And most carbon pricing has a rebate to people in their taxes so that people in lower income brackets are not affected by that. And that's really important. So they already have one in Canada. It was put into place last year. Um, the European Union has been operating with cap and trade and some carbon pricing in four of its biggest emission sectors for a long time. But we need a global carbon price because otherwise what happens is leakage. You know, you squish something down and it shoots out the sides. That's what's happening. We're squishing carbon down, but then it's shooting out the sides in other countries. So if I could wave a magic wand, if I could be like the queen of the universe for one day, um, I would put a carbon price on the whole world immediately with rebates and with care for people who are already poor, marginalized and disadvantaged and use those funds to help with those very problems. And that it isn't a silver bullet. It isn't a be all and end all, but it's a good first step that we can do with the political systems and with the economic systems that we have in place today. Thank you for that, Joanne. Uh, Catherine, there is an appetite to hear more about uh, the psychological and perhaps political underpinnings of uh, the resistance in the evangelical Christian movement uh, to climate change. Could you speak a little bit more about that, please? Absolutely. Before I do, let me just put a link to the Climate Leadership Council in the uh, chat here. It's a bipartisan organization of uh, political leaders, policymakers, and corporations, including AT&T, Ford Motors, and even ExxonMobil, who support carbon pricing. So if you want to learn more about that, that's a great place to go. And Citizens Climate Lobby is a place where people can get involved to lobby for policies like that. It's great. It's a bipartisan organization. Uh, so how did U.S. evangelicals become so resistant to the idea that climate is changing and humans are responsible? I emphasized U.S. there because that's not the case in other countries. In fact, I'm actually the climate ambassador for the World Evangelical Alliance. The World Evangelical Alliance represents 600 million evangelicals around the world. And the Secretary General, Bishop Ephraim Tendero, was a representative for his country, the Philippines, to the Paris Climate Agreement. So Christian organizations outside the US care deeply and show significant leadership on climate action. So that begs the question even more, what is going on inside the United States? Because when you look at the Bible, the Bible's very clear. It doesn't say climate change anywhere, but it talks about having responsibility for creation, gardening or tilling creation, uh, caring for the poor. And even in Revelation, which I didn't cite, it says, God will destroy those who destroy the earth. So there's really no ambiguity in the Bible. People cherry pick little quotes like, oh, God said he would never flood the earth again, so sea level can't be rising. Or God said there will always be seasons, so it can't be getting warmer. And in fact, our most popular global weirding episode is called, What Does the Bible Say About Climate Change? And it actually goes through each of these bible sounding myths and talks about how they aren't real, not even from a science perspective. They're not real from a theological perspective either. So how do we get in this place? It turns out the number one predictor of what we think about climate change, if we agree with 200 years of science, is simply where we fall on the political spectrum. And since the beginning of the United States, there has been an increasing connection between faith and politics. It didn't just start four years ago. It started back in the 1700s. Because up until that time, churches were very hierarchical and the heads of the churches were in England. 
So the United States had to kind of reinvent its religious landscape and it reinvented it in a way that was very uniquely American, focusing on individuals, on individual rights, on individual knowledge, and not on a hierarchy of decision-making and a hierarchy of knowledge and a hierarchy of theology. So as a result, as it became more and more and more politicized, it got to the point where people's statement of faith is being written more by their politics than by what the Bible says. And if the two come into conflict, many people will go with their politics over what the Bible says. And so the way I think of it today is this. I think of it as there's a lot of people in the U.S. who are what I would call political Christians. In other words, their statement of faith is literally written by their politics first and only a distant second by the Bible. And then there's people who are theological Christians, people whose statement of faith is written by the Bible, and that influences their politics. And there's some overlap between the political and the theological Christians, but a lot of what we hear in the news, a lot of the headlines about those evangelicals is actually referring to political Christians. People who have taken that label and applied it to a particular brand of politics that if you looked at the Bible, if Jesus came back today, you wouldn't even recognize it. So um, another question uh, that's sort of more general, it's looking at, given the results of the presidential election, are you more or less hopeful that the American government uh, will take action? Um, I'm more hopeful that there will be action taken because you'll have a president that understands it's serious and has promised to take action. But at the same time, it isn't only up to the president. There's the Congress, there's Senate, there's again, powerful lobbying interests. And so again, we cannot pin our hopes solely in a single political figure, because even under Obama, he accomplished the Clean Power Plan, which has been partially rolled back by the Trump administration, and that was nowhere near enough to meet our Paris goals. So we need everybody and we need everything, and the good news is, is that people are taking action. So again, as individuals, the Episcopal Church has this great uh, program where you can sign up online, and I'll make sure that you have the link to that exact website afterwards to circulate, where individuals can reduce their footprint. There's the We Are Still In movement, where organizations have joined to reduce their carbon footprint. And businesses from Microsoft to Apple to Google are getting in on reducing their carbon footprint and even Amazon now, thank goodness. Each of us has a role to play. It's not up to a single person. It's not up to a single administration. They can make an important contribution, but they themselves are not sufficient and we shouldn't think that they are. Wonderful. Thank you. And um, do you have any other, uh, the, the top question also asks, stays on a policy level. Um, aside from a carbon uh, tax, do you have any other recommendations uh, for organizations that are actually doing the advocacy work for climate change? Yes, absolutely. So the most important thing to do is to talk about why climate change matters and what we can do to fix it and to advocate for change through our organizations. So it's really important that everybody understand why it matters to me who I am. It matters to me because I'm a mom. It matters to me because I'm a Christian. It matters to me because I live in Texas. It matters to me because I love winter snow and winter sports and those are being affected. Um, it matters to me because it affects the poorest and most vulnerable people. And that's not fair, whether it's here or on the other side of the world. So each of us already has the values we need to care about climate change, but we haven't connected the dots. It is so important for every organization to help, whether it's the Rotary Club, whether it's the gardeners, whether it's you know, a parent teacher association, whether it's a church or a faith-based organization or a community organization, help people connect the dots to understand why it matters to them already. They already cared about it, they just didn't realize it. And then positive constructive things that each person can do, which can include obviously reducing our own carbon footprint, but it can include working together because together as a community, as a body, we have so much more power. Working together to affect change at the scale of our organization in our spheres of influence. So uh, partly this is from my own experience uh, that the awareness of the disparate effects of climate change along with many mm -hmm. other related things it can be just the effects of uh, get using gas for heating and and, and uh, heating and, and cooking can have negative effects on asthma and stuff. What is uh, your experience now between the outreach between different groups, between say the 
majority and the communities affected? Well, it's interesting because so often people who work with uh, marginalized communities and poor communities will say, we already have so much on our plate. We can't take on anything else. And that is a fallacy born of the idea that we feel like climate change is one more thing on our priority list. Mm -hmm. So we have poverty, we have lack of access to basic health care, we have lack of opportunity in education, we have all these things on our list and then climate change is down maybe number 12 or number 14 or number 18. And along comes this person, this outsider telling us that we have to bump it up and we're like, don't you understand? We have things right now, right here today and we don't have time for this. But Here's the difference. What I would say is climate change doesn't belong on our list at all. Because the only reason we care about climate change is because it affects what? It affects poverty. It affects exposure to pollution. It affects uh, access to basic health care and clean water and education and opportunities. The only reason we care about it is because it affects everything already at the top of our list. And so by fixing climate change, we can actually start working on fixing some of these things. And if we don't fix climate change, we're never gonna be able to fix these things. It's like we have a bucket and we're pouring all of our effort and time and everything we have into this bucket to try to fix these very urgent issues. But there's a hole in the bottom of the bucket and the hole is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the hole is climate change. We have to patch the hole in order to fill the bucket. Otherwise, we never will.